concepts of right reason and many would argue revelation. Over the past 10 years, however, some conservatives have contended that modern liberalism's gospel of autonomy and diversity over and against reason and truth represents the logical working out of that same founding. They consequently don't believe that recourse to the founding can save America from the implications of Justice Anthony Kennedy's mystery of life passage in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. On the contrary, these statements are presented as the founding's fulfillment. Now, these analyses have been given expression by scholars like Patrick Janine and Michael Handy. Their arguments have been challenged, particularly for their genealogy of ideas. Is there, for example, a more or less direct link between aspects of John Locke's thought via James Madison's Federalist 10 to Justice Kennedy's jurisprudence? Does the trajectory run so straight or exist at all? We'll come back to that point later in my remarks, but for the moment, let me say that to my mind, <clears throat> the issue is not whether concepts of rights have been detached from natural law in many people's minds, or that our culture just mistakes liberty for license. All that is true. The issue is how much of this, if anything, is owed to the founding. That an appeal to natural rights was part and parcel of the American Revolution is not in question. The issue is to what this appeal to natural rights and the associated rhetoric of liberty was tethered. Herein, I'd suggest, is part of the answer as to whether some American conservatives' critique of the founding is valid. Or, if most founders' ideas of rights are essentially grounded in, say, nominalist assumptions, the denial that there are any essences beyond any one individual's reality, or grounded upon voluntarist assumptions, the idea that God's will is the first and only cause of things and that his will is not bound by anything, including reason, then I think we would have reason to believe that the conservative critique of the founding would be valid. Tonight, I'd like to suggest, and this is my thesis, that the idea of natural rights, at least as articulated during the founding period, was not in fact informed by such sources. That it was linked to the idea of natural law. One, it's several removes from the writings of Thomas Aquinas, but not so distant as to be without any substance in the minds of leading American founders or without any significance in the workings of law, especially common law. That same natural law from which natural rights were derived, a derivation I think given embryonic form in Aquinas, medieval canon lawyers before beginning, being given more definitive form by Francisco Suarez, also provided a framework about how these rights would be exercised and the moral goods which these rights serve to protect and promote. Now, one way to begin this discussion is to go straight to the heart of the matter, which is, of course, John Locke. I often think that much of the conservative debate today about America's founding functions as a proxy for the never ending Locke wars. Founding skeptics generally re regard Locke as deeply problematic, and his influence on the founding is one reason for what they see as its lamentable long term fruits. Now, there's very little question that features of Locke's thought, such as his empiricist methodology and his pain pleasure conception of happiness, are in tension, to say the least, with the natural law tradition. Yet there are other aspects of Locke which concur with that same tradition. Locke defined, for example, true pleasure in terms of acting, as he wrote in different places, in quote, the ways of virtue of doing, quote, what is fit to be done, and in, quote, denying ourselves the satisfaction of our own desires where reason does not authorize them, end quote. But what really matters is how the founders understood Locke and to what purpose they applied their understanding. The founder most explicit in his reliance on natural law reasoning, James Wilson, is fully aware of all those ambiguities in Locke 
that Wilson believed had helped to facilitate a certain degree of skepticism. The point, however, <clears throat> is the lens through which Wilson and other founders read Locke. In more recent times, <clears throat> perhaps as a reaction to scholars singling out Locke as responsible for all our current woes, other scholars have portrayed the American founding as one big endless Locke fest. <laughs> but another way of approaching this topic is through the perspective offered by the distinguished historian of the founding, Forrest MacDonald, in his 1985 book, Ordo, Novus Ordo Seclorum, The Intellectual Origins of the Constitution. In this book, MacDonald noted that many of the arguments leading up to 1776 gravitated around issues of property. And he noted how pre-revolutionary Americans made a strong link between liberty and property. He also noted that Locke's way of summarizing the responsibility of government to preserve all men in their lives, liberties, and estates was to locate this responsibility under the general name of property. Thus constituted, such a government would have no other powers except those compatible with this end. And any government that violated such strictures about property was illegitimate. But the point that MacDonald underscored is that Locke's theory of property and rights suited the revolutionary's goals in 1776. It's noticeable, MacDonald pointed out, that there was no new publication for 164 years of Locke's two treatises following its only American publication in the colonial period in 1773. Perhaps this was because, MacDonald speculates, Locke's treatment of property with its references to numerous obligations in justice and charity attached to its use didn't fit into the idea of a commercial republic that took hold in the decades following the revolution. Nor is it evident that when referencing Locke that the founders bought into any apparatus of nominalism or voluntarism. And this I'd suggest is because many of them read Locke in the context of their appreciation of the Anglican divine, Richard Hooker, and through their detestation of Thomas Hobbes. As many of you know, <clears throat> there was no teleology for reason to know in Thomas Hobbes' thought. For Hobbes, the issue was how to create order in the midst of thousands of individuals as they sought to impose their own meaning on human existence. Such ideas provided some of the theoretical foundations for absolutism and the divine right of kings. While founders like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams disagreed about many things, they rejected Hobbes' rationale for authority as alien to reason and alien to liberty. In his 1775 essay, The Farmer Refuted, Alexander Hamilton even described Hobbes' doctrine as, quote, absurd and impious, that is, against reason and against true religion. They just thus rejected the notion that humans are merely material beings incapable of self-government and destined to be ruled by unaccountable sovereigns. Instead, many founders read Locke through the lens of Richard Hooker, the Anglican scholar who reformulated natural law arguments and their implications for constitutional order in post-Reformation England. Hooker was a major reference point for those believing and nominal Anglicans who helped to draft key revolutionary texts. Hooker's writings particularly shaped the thought of James Wilson, who, as I mentioned, was the revolution's most prominent natural law thinker. So too did the work of another important influence upon the founders and the ways in which they thought about rights. The historian I mentioned before, Forrest MacDonald, underlined just how conscious America's founders were of what they called the rights of Englishmen. Now, this language, I'd argue, reflects many sources, but it particularly reflects the influence of the English jurist, judge, and Tory politician, Sir William Blackstone, and his four-volume commentaries on the laws of England. 
Blackstone's commentaries were published between 1765 and 1770, and they were republished eight times in his lifetime and in a posthumous edition in 1783. The scholarly literature that details the impact of Blackstone's commentary, commentaries on the English colonies and the early United States is wide, deep, and extensive. Blackstone's commentaries were widely read by the founding generation. As no less than Edmund Burke pointed out in a speech to the House of Commons on the eve of the Revolutionary War, he said, quote, they have sold nearly as many of Blackstone's commentaries in America as in England. American courts, for example, including the Supreme Court, have looked repeatedly to Blackstone's commentaries for guidance on the common law as it stood in the era of the Constitution's framing. Blackstone's fondness for trial by jury was shared by the founders, as reflected in the Constitution's Sixth and Seventh Amendments. As MacDonald points out, Blackstone's thought was pervasive at the Constitutional Convention. Now, it's worth remembering that the lectures on which the commentaries were based were delivered to successive audiences of Oxford undergraduates. Some of them were young men interested in pursuing legal careers in London. But others studied law because when they returned to their home counties, they were likely to serve as justices of the peace. In other words, this was an audience similar to the type of gentlemen who supported the revolution in 1775 and who gathered together at the Constitutional Convention uh, almost 10 years, over 10 years later. Now, in many ways, the Blackstonian project was an exercise in accessible legal education, and it succeeded beyond Blackstone's own expectations. As Blackstone's most vehement critic, Jeremy Bentham, of course, stated, quote, the commentaries had a more extensive circulation, have obtained a greater share of esteem or applause and consequently of influence than any other writer who on that subject has ever yet appeared. But you may ask, well, what has this got to do with natural rights and natural law? Some have argued, including some American professors of law and historians of law, that Blackstone was a historical pragmatist who sought to justify the 18th century British constitution by virtue of its provenance. They view Blackstone's references to natural law at the beginning of book one of the commentaries as a type of intellectual embellishment to make the content more palatable to overwhelmingly Christian audiences with a taste for enlightenment philosophy. Now Blackstone's contemporary biographer, my fellow Australian Wilfred Prest, sees matters rather differently. Blackstone, according to Prest, regarded natural law as to use his biographer's description as fundamental. Natural law was no more peripheral to Blackstone than a chapel was peripheral to the foundation of an English university college at any time between the 13th and 19th centuries. Whatever the case today, God's will for man, <coughs> the subject of interest and concern for 18th century law and lawyers like Blackstone who himself was a devout Christian. For such individuals, the divine order of creation was reasonably seen as a pattern and precondition for man's ordering of his soul and thus of society. Indeed, questions of conscience, rightly understood, were integral to Blackstone's theoretical structure. For Blackstone, people's consciences formed by the notion of natural rights conferred on them by the creator, set up the trust upon which authority was conferred by peoples on government. And while Blackstone insisted rigorously that within constitutional and positive law, there was no restraint on parliamentary sovereignty, he did state that a basic violation of, by the government of its fundamental trust might amount to a dissolution of the constitution and a license of, to the people to construct a new one. Such a case in Blackstone's view would be one where, quote, though the positive laws are silent, nature and reason prevail, end quote. 
Closer study of Blackstone reveals natural law is playing a far more salient role in his commentaries than often realized. When he advertised the lectures upon which the commentaries were based, Blackstone framed them at least twice as a question of examining the municipal laws of England, the common law, and to compare, quote, compare them frequently with the law of nature and other nations. It's not a coincidence that section two of book one, where Blackstone lays out his understanding of natural law, was the number one target of Bentham's wrath in his fragment on government. That section of the commentaries, incidentally, draws directly on the Swiss legal theorist, Jean-Jacques Boulamarquis' treatise, The Principles of Natural and Politic Law. Another book that was closely read by numerous American founders as they developed their ideas about constitutionalism. Now, on one level, natural law serves in Blackstone's commentaries as a type of judicial check. Customs were only to be accepted as natural as common law only if they were found by courts to conform to natural justice and natural reason. Now, that's a minimalist account. But we can go further and note that natural law functions in Blackstone as a guiding principle that allowed for incremental reform of common law. Blackstone also knew that not all English law, common law, could be reconciled with natural law precepts. And he had no hesitation in pointing out where this occurred, so much so that he declared that judges who imposed the death penalty for minor offenses risked incurring, quote unquote, the guilt of blood. But there are at least four other ways in which natural law features prominently in the commentaries. First, Blackstone defines law in general as a rule of action prescribed by a superior power. Something closely related to Blackstone's definition of natural law as the rule of, of human action prescribed by the creator and discoverable by reason. The very first element in Blackstone's description of jurisprudence is that it is, quote, a science which distinguishes the criterions of right and wrong. Note those words, right and wrong, not useful and helpful. Blackstone subsequently arranged the whole structure of the commentaries to show how the rights and wrongs, which were the formal objects of English law, substantially corresponded to and protected the natural rights, which, quote, properly, i.e. naturally, constituted the objectives of law. Second, Blackstone insisted that the primary rules and fundamental principles of English law had to be, quote, weighed and compared with the precepts of the law of nature. Indeed, express references in the commentaries to particular implications of natural law are so numerous that some of the reasons it advances to explain features of English law might also be counted as natural law reasons. So here are just some of the occasions in which references to natural law are used to explain particular aspects of common law. In book one, we see it used with reference to individual rights limitations on the crown, the rights of ambassadors, the poor laws, slavery, maintenance of children, maintenance of parents, maintenance of bastards. In book two, natural law is used with reference to property, to succession by occupancy, property and water, occupation on death of a tenant, treatment of animals, popular action, and usury. In book three, natural law is used with reference to self-defense, multiplicity of courts, the need for certainty, unjust enrichment, abatement of freehold and trespass. In book four, natural law is referenced <clears throat> with regard to the basis of criminal law, punishment, marital coercion, duress, offenses against private morality, offenses against the law of nations, Self-defense, homicide, dueling, sexual perversions, arson, larceny, robbery, outlawry, and game laws. I could go on, but I think you get the point. 
Third, Blackstone explicitly invokes the law of nations in his preface to the discussion of municipal law. In Blackstone, the law of nations occupies the same position that the jus gentium occupied in the scholastic treatises. The jus gentium's meaning had shifted in the writings of someone like Hooker from the law at once natural and positive, common to all societies, to a new meaning as the natural and contractual law governing relations between states. Blackstone employed the newer meaning, although he used formulae much closer to the older scholastic books. Fourth, <clears throat> there is the notion of divine law, that part of the natural law which God has revealed in the scriptures. So since this is merely the natural law in another mode, the divine law receives little separate discussion in the commentaries but its importance for Blackstone remains. For him, it was, quote, of infinitely more importance than any speculation on natural law via natural reason. It is the basis of Christianity. And Blackstone says, quote, Christianity is part of the laws of England. Divine law was thus for Blackstone, one of those available criterions of right and wrong, which in jurisprudence, must be distinguished from positive law with care. Blackstone noted that offenses could be against the revealed law of God, others were against the law of nature, and some were offenses against neither. These distinctions enabled Blackstone to insist upon the existence of private moral duties, which, quote, man is bound to perform, considered only as an individual, and hence of private vices which are offenses against divine law, but which are beyond the remit of human law because they are not of immediate concern to what might be called the political common good. Now, this distinction between private, natural private duties and the private natural private rights upheld by the law of England was Blackstone's way of maintaining the classical natural law tradition that crime and sin are not coextensive. So in summary, <clears throat> the concerns which Blackstone identified as central to his introductory discourse are central to the commentaries themselves. While the autonomy and positivity of common law are insisted upon, natural law is freely admitted as a source of law and a source of jurisprudential explanation. Now, None of what I've said tonight should be construed as defending every aspect of Blackstone's conception of natural law. But what's not in doubt <clears throat> is that those reading Blackstone carefully, as many in the American colonies did in the years leading up to and following the revolution, well understood the connections between common law, positive law, natural rights, and natural law. There's plenty of evidence that numerous founders drew on Blackstone to root natural right claims directly in natural law. As noted by Blackstone's biographer, Blackstone's clear stated emphasis on natural law and the rights to which it gave rise was particularly important in formulating and defending the case for armed resistance to George III and the British Parliament. Take, for instance, Alexander Hamilton's Farmer Refuted. In refuting Hobbesian ideas, Hamilton pointed out that, quote, to grant that there is a supreme intelligence who rules the world and has established laws to regulate the actions of his creatures, and then assert that man may be considered as perfectly free from all restraints of law and government, appear to a common understanding altogether irreconcilable. Hamilton then says, quote, good and wise men in all ages have supposed that the deity from the relations we stand to, to himself and to each other has constituted an eternal and immutable law, which is obligatory upon all mankind prior to any inhuman institution, whatever, end quote. That's plainly an invocation of natural law and divine law. Hamilton winds up this part of his discussion by stating that, quote, 
what is called the law of nature, which being coeval with mankind and dictated by God himself is of course superior in obligation to any other. It is binding over all the globe in all countries and at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this, and such of them as are valid derive all their authority immediately or immediately from this original. Here, Hamilton is directly quoting and specifically footnotes none other than William Blackstone. Nor can we discount the founders' constant references to something else referenced by Blackstone, the law of nations, the jus gentium, which many founders read about through the lens of modern Protestant natural law thinkers like Emer de Vatal. This embodied those rules, norms, and rights which different regimes had come to recognize as reasonable for all nations to embrace. This is not a tradition that lends itself to skepticism, relativism, or nominalism. Lastly, <clears throat> I'd like to mix into this discussion, the Scottish Enlightenment and its outsized impact on colonial America. This impact is evident from the books that fill the libraries of educated 18th century Americans and their colleges, thanks in part to Presbyterian ministers and university presidents like John Witherspoon. And these collections included much more than just the works of David Hume. They also contained philosophical writings by figures like Francis Hutcheson. Such books wove together happiness as embracing the virtues with the language of natural rights. Hutchinson's main philosophical text, for instance, was read by three generations of 18th century Americans in colonial educational settings. This integrated an understanding of God as a benevolent being and a positive view of human nature into formal instruction in natural and civil law. This book also took a firm position against Hume's skepticism and underscores Hutchinson's ultimate adherence to a religious foundation for ethics. Or consider Hutchinson's fellow Scott, who I mentioned before, James Wilson. Towards the end of his life, the philosopher, the late Daniel Robinson, illustrated just how much Wilson drew upon to the extent of paraphrasing the Scottish, the Scottish common sense philosopher and critic of Hume, Thomas Reed, to explicate the connections between rights and what Reed called in his 1785 essay on reasoning, quote, the common principles of human nature. So I think I've belabored that point enough. <clears throat> so if this is all true, I think we can say some things about natural rights, natural law in the founding. First, the language of natural rights in the founders cannot be separated from the idea of natural law and maybe even divine law. Yes, that natural law is seen as giving rise to natural rights, but the notion that natural rights could somehow be understood as separate or separated from the whole normative apparatus of natural law would have seemed rather strange, if not ridiculous, to most, if not all, founders. Second, <clears throat> it's not plausible that such thinkers could have, would have contended that, quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Planned Parenthood v. Casey. No American founder who had read Locke through the lens of Richard Hooker, or who had thoroughly absorbed Blackstone's commentaries, or who had studied the works of Hutchinson and Reed could have come to such conclusions. As Thomas West points out in his book, The Political Theory of the American Founding, quote, the founders concerned with natural rights and their concern with virtue did not belong to distinct categories of thought. Instead, they thought of virtue as a condition of freedom and a requirement of the laws of nature, end quote. Third, <clears throat> to imagine that the founders wrote a declaration of independence, drafted state constitutions, state bills of rights, 
a national constitution and a national bill of rights designed to undermine the virtue upon which the new regime depended, or that they effectively acted to detach natural rights from the natural law from which they believed such rights arose, requires believing one of two things. <clears throat> Either they were foolish, insofar as they somehow created a Hobbesian regime without realizing they were doing so, or they were trying to do something wicked. That is, they were trying to create a regime at odds with what they believed while cleverly lying about what they were really doing. I don't find either of those possibilities plausible. The notion that James Madison's Federalist 10 was a gateway drug by which the constitution enabled radical individualism to enter America's political bloodstream requires us to read the idea of natural rights out of the natural law framework in which such rights were clearly articulated at the time of the founding. And I don't find that a plausible argument. Indeed, there are many other far more plausible candidates for the obvious detachment of the language and concepts of rights from natural law. These might include, for instance, the 19th century German historicism that shaped American progressives like President Wilson and John Dewey. Its intellectual roots are about as distant from the notions of natural law, natural rights, let alone divine law, as it's possible to be. Or consider the type of legal positivism associated with figures like Hans Kelsen, which made an enormous impact upon much of the 20th century Anglo-American world. Or consider more recent phenomena such as the Cultural Revolution, which gathered a pace in the 1960s, and the associated sexual revolution, which has now reached the point of telling us that biology is largely irrelevant to who we are as men and women. Or what about the disintegration of mores and moral habits, once enculturated by organized religion throughout America, much of which has in many cases collapsed into sentimental humanitarianism and or social justice ideology and or political activism. Like all political arrangements, those which emerged in the 18th century last quarter in the American colonies then the Confederation, then the Republic, was not perfect. Its weaknesses and unresolved tensions manifested themselves and have required correction. The issue of whether some of those corrections have worked out as expected is open to debate. But I do think that trying to trace back so many of America's present cultural, political, and legal woes to the founding is, in light of my brief remarks this evening, a mistaken exercise. In trying to understand America's challenges today, we can surely do better. Thank you. I'm very happy to entertain questions. Yes. Um, if I remember correctly, if I understood you correctly, you said that natural law in the black term is the science of right and wrong? Criterion of right and criterions of right and wrong. Criterion of right and wrong. Okay. So I'm curious. I, I think you did use the word science, and I'm curious yes, I did. what you meant by science. Um, and in a related question, what you mean by like where is he getting the notion of virtue? Okay, well, first thing is that um, the language of science, don't think of that in terms of the way that we use science today. It's really, by science, they mean a type of wisdom. Wisdom, so it's not the empirical sciences. So Blackstone doesn't view this as an empiricist ex exercise in trying to sort out and define and effectively codify what was common law. So. It's, it's not a science as we would understand that today. It's something very different. It's a sort of prudential approach to understanding wisdom, truth, et cetera. Um, uh, the second part in terms of virtue. Well, lawyers don't talk very much about virtue for the most part, right? Because virtue per se in itself is not the immediate concern of law. But I think it's very clear that when it comes to those parts where he does reference virtue, on one hand, he has in mind <clears throat> sort of classic natural law explanations of what that means. He certainly references that in some of the earlier books that he wrote. But he's also talking about Christianity. He makes it very, very clear that, as I said, I quote 
Christianity is part of the law of England. So that's the other source where he clearly believes that our virtues are coming from. So it's a type of classic right reason plus revelation. Yes. Thank you for your lecture. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about... Everyone's um, curious. Oh, <laughs> um, if you could expand a bit more on the role of divine law in the founding, because, mm -hmm. you know, kind of playing devil's advocate to the kind of um, conservative skepticism that you mentioned earl at the beginning of your lecture, um, thinking back to Aquinas and the way that he talks about uh, reason and even natural law, um, that alone as a foundation for morality can often lead to very different results. And one would make many mistakes along the way if you don't have something like a divine law um, or some kind of moral compass. Um, you know, the, the first principles of practical reason, do good, sure. avoid evil, can lead to all sorts of atrocities if they aren't carefully guided or something. So I guess I'm just wondering, um, you know, to, to play devil's advocate, is divine law in itself as a, as a foundation for moral theory enough? Um, is that without any divine law, without right. any moral compass, could that contain the seeds of its own destruction mm -hmm. um, as some of the, you know, conservative skeptics might, might say? Sure. Well, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> If you go back and you read enough of the, the, um, uh, the history of the American Revolution and you read, for example, the role, the very important role played by mainly Presbyterian and other forms of Protestant clerics, and they are among the ones who are the most vehemently angry with George III and more specifically the British Parliament, they're constantly invoking divine law Biblical sources, um, you know, they're comparing they're comparing George the Third with um, Saul and all this sort of stuff. So that is all in the air. That's all in the air. So that's one thing I think it's very important to keep in mind that there is this whole dimension of the American Revolution that was very much underscored by specific religious claims that partly came from particular readings of Scripture. But also, I, I suppose you would say some of the um, traditional Presbyterian discontent with hierarchy per se. <clears throat> it's interesting that the I was reading a biography, a biography, a, a book recently about the uh, the British generals who lost the war, and they the, one of the groups they identify as the most pernicious. They really didn't like were Presbyterian clergy because these people were very good at invoking religious claims and getting people worked up religiously to defend themselves or defend the revolution against the um, against the British. So in some people, like Witherspoon, for example, you'll find explicit invocations of divine law. You'll find explicit um, references to divine law in the in some of the things that Charles Carroll Carrollton wrote, who was of course the only Catholic to sign the Declaration of Independence. He he invokes divine law on numerous occasions. Um, Others, as we know, use more deistic language, but it's still a type of sense that, that there is a creator and that creator, the fact that the creator exists, and we know things about that creator, a creator who has revealed himself through our reason in the natural world, etc., has something to say about what we're doing and why we're doing. <clears throat> so uh, that's, that's, of course, different from when you read something like the Constitution, which doesn't invoke specific divine law claims or anything like that. But I'm not sure that the people who were there writing this thing, drafting this thing, debating this thing, had a sense that somehow these arrangements would last or could last unless they were buttressed at some level by religion, right? So the fact that they didn't say it doesn't mean that they uh, didn't believe it. Um, Professor Wolf used a phrase uh, at dinner tonight, I think, was the furniture, was this part of the furniture, which I think is a very good way of um, understanding it. And I don't understand those people who, who say, well, they didn't say these things, therefore they didn't believe these things. There's all sorts of things we don't say, but we still believe, right? Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, invocations of divine law are certainly working there at the level of a lot of popular discussion of these things, particularly among um, 
the very large segment of the population that were, they're often called uh, dissenters, by the which they mean religious dissenters, meaning Presbyterian basically, or non-Church of England for the most part. Um, <clears throat> and then you have some specific founders who do invoke divine law and do invoke the claims of scripture. Um, but I do think that, that um, the notion that they thought they would be acting in a way that had nothing to do with divine law would have seemed very, very strange to them. Because this is an, these are societies which are, at this point, intensely religious in ways that I think we maybe find difficult to, to appreciate today. Uh, and even with someone like a Blackstone, who's a very careful legal thinker, he doesn't have any hesitation about invoking divine law for these things. And the people reading him in Britain and more importantly in the Americas would have recognized this. Are you curious as well? <laughs> I want to ask why, if the founders rooted their claims on natural rights in the natural law, why would they not reference the natural law more frequently? You really only see it in the Declaration. It's not present at all in the Constitution. It's not really brought up at all in the Federalist Papers. Um, so why not make reference to it? Why so much more emphasis on the rights? Uh, well, for a couple of reasons. One is I think that <clears throat> this much of this project involves an assertion of natural rights in a way that hadn't quite been done in such a direct fashion for, well, maybe ever in some respects, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is that even the word natural implies, from what I think certainly implied for them, some idea of a type of natural law. So that's the first. Thing. The second thing I'd say is that when you engage in devising a constitution, if you look at most constitutions, even ones uh, that were written at times of um, societies were quite religious, you don't see lots and lots of invocations of the divine. I think, for example, of um, what's the Constitution of Ireland? It starts off with an invocation of the Trinity, right? right? But that sticks out because it's unusual. It's unusual for these things to be stated so directly. So I think we need to remember that the, the exercise of the Constitutional Convention was an exercise in building a constitution of trying to build in a number of concerns that the revolution had sought to devise. Um, but they're not in the business of trying to push a revolution at this point. They're in the business of trying to bring order to this world. So <clears throat> the other thing to keep in mind, and this is something else we talked about at dinner, is that a lot of the, the reflection of natural law is less found at this period in constitutional documents. But if you go and look at common law, which is the operative way in which most of the colonies were operating, it's full of these things. It's full of references to natural law, even divine law. So, and remember most law at this point consists of common law. The constitutional law is gonna be worked out over time but the, the operative law for most people at most, most places in all the states is some form of common law, often by this stage starting to be codified in practice and in thought by people reading people like Blackstone. So I think that's very important to understand what type of law is most operative for people at this point in history. It's not the constitution. It's not some of these other, things. not even the declaration. It's these things that have been worked out over a long period of time in Britain and then supplemented, supplemented by colonial assemblies and colonial judges. But divine law and natural law is regularly invoked in these sorts of things. They had no hesitation about invoking things like the Decalogue, for example, when they're making, um, when they're making judgments about things like what constitutes theft. Yes, Ted. So, I read John Locke and I find statements like the following that I don't think I find anywhere in the American founders. Uh, human beings by nature don't owe anything to the country that raised them. At the age of, as soon as they reach the age of majority, they, can, they, they have no obligations, they can just leave. 
human beings actually by nature don't owe anything to anybody except to not harm them, uh, except maybe to help them if it doesn't hurt you at all. There's no natural uh, subordination of between the two sexes. There's nothing about a marriage contract that requires that the husband have any kind of primacy. There's nothing about the marriage contract that can't be dissolved as long as children are going to be provided for in one way or another. If you have a religious doctrine that you claim entitles you to conscientious ex exemptions from any law whatsoever, we can ban, Canon probably should ban that doctrine in advance as dangerous to the public peace. Uh, and slaves always have the right to kill their masters. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of people who think all those things now, and Locke seems to have thought all those things, and none of the founders thought them. Mm -hmm. So for me, the question, and it is a genuine question because I don't know the answer, that's a puzzle for me, um, is, was he just lucky? <laughs> or, or was there, is there, do you see any kind of causal link here? You know, that's very interesting. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, I remember when I mentioned Forrest MacDonald and his, his treatment of Locke. Um, <clears throat> there's an argument to say, and I think this is what MacDonald was arguing. And so far, this is, I think his is the best answer I've heard to that type of question. But that type of question you just asked is a very common question. Lots of people have pointed this out. Is that um, the founders, of course, lots of them had obviously read Locke, but they also found him extremely convenient in this period leading up to the revolution, right? Because, and I, I talked about some of this in my remarks because he's channeling so many of these things he thinks the government needs to protect and uphold. And if it doesn't uphold, it could be all through this medium of property, which of course was something that was very much on the minds of, uh, of Americans really from, you know, from the Stamp Act onwards, et cetera. <clears throat> so, so I think, I don't know if this is true for all of them, but my guess would be that they used those parts of Locke that they liked and tended to pass over some of the other things. So, I mean, a good example of this is, um, we talked about James Wilson, for example. I mean, he was very aware of all these ambiguities and things he didn't like in Locke, but he just took what he wanted and he also read it through a particular lens. So I think this is part of what's, what's happening. And as I mentioned in my remarks, he, it's remarkable how Locke drops out of sight once the revolution's over and they've got what they want. And some of the things you mentioned, they ignore, but they also ignore some of the, the um, implications of, you need to use your property justly and you need to be charitable. With it. They don't talk very much about those sorts of things after but they didn't really talk about those things at all during the revolution. But, and they also, I think that sort of drops out with a lot of the American founders in, the, in this earlier period, because they're trying to build a commercial republic. And a republic in which commerce is seen as the locus of life, et cetera, et cetera. And <clears throat> invoca invoca um, invocating Locke in terms of justice and charity and how you're obliged to use your property to help others doesn't quite fit <laughs> with the desire to build a commercial republic. So I think there's a fair amount of strategic use here. And I think that's true of many people who use Locke today. It's a lot of strategic use of to make certain points and to um, ignore others. I saw this, for example, with the book that came out I can't think of the title now, but it was basically it was a book that came out last year that basically read the whole revolution through the through the medium of Locke. I can't think who the author was, um, but I read it. It was interesting, but he basically just ignored everything about Locke that didn't fit into the the picture, and so he had some references to natural rights. And he, he I know the author himself, I, um, Brad Thompson. Brad Thompson, I think it's his. Okay. Um, he was a Randian at one point in his life. I don't know if he is now. I'm not sure if he is now. I don't want to disparage him. I think he's a Christian. I don't. <laughs> but, but you read the book and you think, but, but you keep saying, but, but, but what about this? And what about that? And, and so I think that's a, there's a fair amount of, a, let's call it Locke in mythology that goes on in terms of the way that Locke is employed, was employed in his time, was not employed in the 
constitutional period as much, but now is uh, deployed by all sorts of people who want to assert certain things as being, as a, as a way of shutting down the discussion about, the, about any number of subjects. But the thing about Locke is that, I mean, we forget, he's also the guy who wrote the book called The Reasonableness of Christianity. So the notion that Locke is this, that, and he also, if you look at things like um, his letter on toleration, the number of times he talks about truth over and over and over again, and you can't read that and think, okay, he's one of these people who roots the concern for tolerance in a type of relativism. He doesn't. He thinks truth is important. That's where he derives toleration from. So um, that's a long way of answering your question, but I think that's the answer. A lot of it is strategic at the time and now. Yes. I'm wondering if, yeah, kind of jumping off of, of Locke, a uh, thinker that I don't remember if he makes his way into the farmer or he did, but um, do you think the founders are doing something similar with, I think, the, maybe the, the better case for a, <laughs> a, a potentially um, anti natural law thinker, I think, would be Montesquieu. I mean, I think straight up at the beginning, I'm at least fairly persuaded by uh, Pierre Manat's kind of reading. Uh -huh. That there is something totally different, like uses virtue language, right? It's, it's definitely smuggling in a very non teleological view of the state as well mm -hmm. as, as humans. Um, and that he's someone who, and he talks about the way to get people to forget religion uh, through commerce, among other things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, one, one would ask, without trying to like make any kind of broader argument about commerce as understood in America, um, do, you, do you see the founders as reading? Wants you through a helpful lens as well? Are they aware of why don't you could be read a lot of different right, ways? Of course. Um, but, but I wonder, is there any sense that um, something's lurking under the surface there, or is he just one among many that, that doesn't seem to stand out? I'm inclined to think, I mean, he's very important, right? There's no doubt about that. I'm, I'm sure um, you probably all read, many of you have probably read that article that was published, was it 1978? Going went through someone who'd gone through all the writings of all the founders and had collected the number of citations made to. So, which text do you think was cited the most by the founders? Anyone want to guess? How do we define founders? Well, um, anyone involved in the, the Declaration of Independence, those who were at the Constitutional Convention, those who were significant writers about this period of time. Which text do you think is referenced the most? Does the Bible count as a Yes, the Bible. The Bible. Yeah. The Bible. Thirty-three percent of the references are to the Bible. Montesquieu is not far behind. Montesquieu, Blackstone, Locke is Locke and Hume are in the one, two, three percent category. So, I'm not telling, saying that that numbers or citations mean everything, but they suggest something, and. The fact that Montesquieu is re referenced so much, I think that has to do with his particular take on the separation of powers. That's very helpful for them when they're framing um, framing the Constitution. Uh, his emphasis upon commerce is extremely important. He clearly likes commercial societies. He sees that as preferable to um, war making societies. He sees um, and and uh, sort of ancient classical societies. He also sees this type of commercial republic as most realized at the time in Britain, which of course is still a major reference point for a lot of the founders. Um, so yes, I mean, I think they, they take a lot of different things from Montes Montesquieu, but there's also things they don't take, like his view of religion. I mean, he sees religion as sort of useful and helpful in certain respects. Um, but he treats it in a rather sociological type of fashion. And there's some of that with some of the founders, um, but it's a selective type of drawing, things that he draws upon when it comes to some of these things. So yes, I think there's a fair amount of that that's going on with him and any number. I think the same is true with Blackstone as well. There's, there's stuff in Blackstone they clearly ignore too. So I think we shouldn't be, but I shouldn't, I don't think we should be surprised that people would be doing this at this particular point in time. It's whenever these types of exercises are engaged in, which are of course relatively rare, people draw upon all sorts of sources from which they take certain things and ignore others. Yes. Could you speculate on um, the occasion for the recovery of law? 
In uh, in in the time of the revolution. No, no. Uh, you said that oh, now. Well, what I said in my remarks was that the next edition of my, of Locke that was the, the two treatises was published in 164 years. Can you just stay closer to the mic? I'm sorry. Yeah. So I think I said it was 164 years. Um, maybe they just needed an updated edition. <laughs> I'm not sure that there was a particular demand to get, we need lock because we've got a particular problem that we need to deal with now. Um, I think it was more a question of just providing a, an updated edition at that particular point in time, because they'd been using the same one for over 150 years when it was published in 1773. I think it's as simple as that. I don't see any particular judicial or legislative agenda or let alone executive agenda driving that at all. And by that point, of course, uh, the people in charge are looking to a lot of other different sources that have very little to do with the founding. Sort of luck might be more emphasized in the 20th century, partly because the progressives were actually often critics of American government. Mm -hmm on grounds of excessive emphasis on property. And so they wanted to tar the founders with Locke's emphasis on property. And I think we get this in Hearts to some extent yes. as well, that Locke assumes a really important part, maybe part of it because of uh, people wanting to read American government in a certain way that emphasizes property, whether because they want to criticize it or Right. Perhaps defended, yeah. right. No, I don't know why. I, I, I don't know that that was the case when this text was republished again in, in a new edition. Could have been, but I don't know. Let me ask about at the end of your talk, you had some extremely cryptic remarks about the idea that there were kind of correctives to the founding over time and some of them might have worked out worse what are you talking about well slavery is one right that's clearly a corrective that i think was implicit in the document itself that had to be sorted out um i think that's one uh, uh i guess bostock would be a good example i think of where some of this stuff has gone you know the the civil because that comes out of the uh, ultimately the civil rights act right so the extension of these things to uh, a new category of people. You know, I can see the Civil Rights Act in 1964 as being a useful corrective and fixing certain problems, but of course it becomes some, a vehicle for other things. That's what we saw happen last year. So that's, that's two non-cryptic examples. I guess I have doubts about considering that I mean, it depends on being like corrective, I guess. I think of a corrective as kind of course change. Oh, well, no, I don't mean that. just kind of flipping the whole thing over. No, no, I, I, <laughs> by corrective, I don't mean fundamental throw it out the door. I mean, doing something that's much more in accordance with what I think were the driving things, driving philosophical principles, driving the founding. And I mean, the slavery one is clearly an example of that. What about just to throw out an idea, the, the New Deal mm -hmm. and a different conception of the role of government in helping to ensure economic equality. So it strikes me that that actually might be something that a, somebody who accepted Catholic social thought would actually find kind of plausible or useful that perhaps the founders had to narrow a view of the role of government with respect to at least some measure of economic equality is a bad term for it, but something like the safety net or something like that. I mean, but that seems to be a significant shift in American public philosophy at the New Deal. Oh, well, I think it, it goes back earlier than that, right? Yeah. It goes back to the late 19th century, early sure. 20th century, where you have progressives running the Democratic Party and Republican Party as well, where you see people like not just Wilson, but people like Teddy Roosevelt wanting to use the uh, the federal government to do all sorts of things that I think are hard to reckon, I think are hard to reconcile with uh, a strict reading of the of the Constitution. Um, 
But no, I, I mean, my, I would hide my views, I think the New Deal and the Great Society programs were deviations from what, now you can argue about whether they were justified or not in terms of their own, whether they were successful or not. I don't think they were particularly, but, um, but I, I think it's very hard to establish a clear link between those sorts of programs and the founding and the constitution. I think they, I think they represent deviation. The and Supreme Court at the time thought the same thing, by the way, because that's why they struck down so much of the legislation until they started to get threatened. Deviation is a loaded word, of course, you know, but uh, change is certainly, you know, I think, it's certainly a significant change from the founding. The classic argument, I think, on the part of those who defend it, is that because is because there were really changed economic circumstances by you know the, the beginning of the 20th century. You know, we were a rural country at the time of the founding, and was becoming what uh, to a great extent an industrial uh, a nation. And uh, of course, transportation and communication had reduced mm -hmm. distances. To a great extent. But just, I'd like to try to play the devil's advocate and not just, you know, view FDR as some evil modern betrayer of the founding uh, <laughs> and kind of ask about uh, whether there are plausible grounds or at least some kind of shift in the idea of the scope of government, the proper scope of government uh, in the uh, 20th century. Well, I mean, there's. Um... There's a difference between what change in continuity is changing, that, is con that is, represents continuity, but nonetheless change, and there's also change that represents not continuity, a break from the past. Um, <clears throat> I suppose you could argue that some of those things that are talked about that were done during the New Deal and even maybe even more during the Great Society programs as a type of common welfare it could be used for appealing to the common welfare part of the Constitution. Uh, I guess you could do that. Um, uh, and yes, we, the circumstances of the 20th century are very different to those of the 19th century, etc. But I'm not sure that the fundamental problems that the Constitution was trying to wrestle with, whether it's things like um, the problem of power, and who has it and how you limit it. I don't think they had changed that much, if at all. Um, and of course, governments, uh, you know, by definition, when they uh, find themselves in emergency situations, take on all sorts of powers that we don't normally let them take on in normal times. But the idea, of course, is, is that in normal times, we go back to what was normal. We don't continue the emergency things that were done during the period of crisis. So hopefully after the pandemic's over, we won't all have to wear these. We'll be able to do all sorts of things like we, although I suspect there'll be things that won't go away. So, um, I mean, that's a roundabout way of answering your question, but I'm not sure that some of the fundamental issues have changed that much. And <clears throat> I would argue that uh, it turns out, this is my political economy side coming out, that those things that government was started to do in the 1930s and even more so in the 1960s, the government turned out not to be so good at doing a lot of those things as well. I mean, um, unemployment in 1939 was as high as it was in 1932. Um, uh, if you look at the Great Society programs, um, I'm not sure they did particularly very much to help people at all. In fact, I think they did a lot of damage, particularly to those very communities that they were supposed to be serving. So, um, <clears throat> so even if you just take away the argument that you allow people, governments to do things in times of emergency, um, all those things that are appealed to in terms of, well, now we live in different circumstances, therefore the government needs to take care of all these different problems. Well, I, think that I tend to think that the government is not usually the first port of call that you should be using in those sorts of things. Uh, and that when big government gets involved, 
in trying to fix the very real pathologies and difficulties and challenges and sins that mark all our lives, it really doesn't, usually doesn't turn out so well for reasons I think we all know. Is there a question? Yes. So I wanna, I'm gonna take this back to a much more sort of philosophical approach. Okay. Um, you said at the end of your talk that we can't separate natural rights from natural law and the thought of the founder. And the I, find, I find it very difficult to believe that you can. Right, and the whole thrust was that the radical individualism we see today cannot be traced to the founders precisely because their rights talk was grounded in natural law. So what I wanted to ask was, is it even possible theoretically to really separate talk of natural rights from talk of natural law, or are the two sort of necessarily joined? Um, <laughs> you indicated that sort of by gesturing at the word natural in right. both. Um, can we separate them at all? Um, and if we can, what would be the grounds for doing that? I mean, I don't think you can, obviously. I don't think you can, I, because I don't see, un unless there's some sort of assertion of will or something like that, but I don't think that human beings are constituted just purely by will. I think we have reason and reason guides our will to make our free choices that shape us internally and shape the world around us, et cetera. So I find it, so I, I, you're asking me if I can conceive of a situation in which rights might be, natural rights might be appealed to an absence of natural law. I mean, there are some people who try to do this for a particular type of Lockean state of nature argument. I don't find it particularly convincing because I don't think you can get away from, even in those cases, you still have to ask yourself questions about human nature and even more specifically about human reason. And so once, once you get into that territory, you're, you're moving in a type of natural law direction. I think it's very hard. I mean, one thing that some people try to do, um, Robert Nozick, for example, in his book, Anarchy, State, Utopia, which is in part a critique of Rawls, but it's also a sort of argument for natural rights without natural law for the most part. But even he, he basically says at one point in that book, he says, well, I guess it's, I know it's not particularly satisfactory to trace natural rights to the writings of John Locke, but I guess that's what we have to do. Well, to, to which the response to that argument is, well, but that's not, that's like me saying, I'm going to appeal back to just a particular thinker rather than well thought out arguments that have developed over time, rather than just saying, well, there, there is Locke, therefore there are natural rights, which is sort of what, <laughs> sort of what Nozick does. And Nozick, you can tell that Nozick himself when he's doing this, is you can tell it's a sort of half-hearted, and I think he even uses the word, it's unsatisfactory. So he himself, he's not a stupid man, he, he himself could see that this was not quite, but that's what he had, that's what he was gonna use. So I find it, so people have tried, and for the most part, I think, in fact, I can't think of any who have succeeded in any substantive way, because once you use the, the, the word natural, to the extent that that implies human nature, which implies human reason, and, and what else could it imply? I'm not sure, maybe some sort of Darwinistic evolutionary thing, but that's not a solid ground for rights because everything's just constantly evolving and changing randomly and then there are no rights. So I don't see how you can do it. And uh, I, there are people who try, but I don't think very satisfactorily. Yes. Um, one of the kind of fascinating phenomena, I think, when you are taking the thought of the founders seriously, as, as, uh, as political theory, uh, is you run into all kinds of instances of, I think, their thoughts setting up various measures by which, you know, if you fail, then our experiment kind of seems to fail. I think this is like a federal paper where Hamilton mentions, like, the tasks of government include getting moral legislators, keeping them moral, and if legislators ever pass laws that exempt themselves from them, you know, like, the whole project has gone off the rails. So it seems like when you start exactly mm. taking those, those things seriously, <laughs> um, the picture gets even bleaker. But I'm wondering, one of the natural right principles, it seems like I think Witherspoon draws on to justifying the revolution, mm -hmm. is kind of a principle of, of distance. And that when a regime is so far from its constituents, you can't actually know the good of the constituents. You don't really have an authority legitimately to 
to represent them anymore. I'm just wondering if you could say anything about, you know, do you see any natural right principles that the founders use that might, we might just kind of like follow back into, well, that was a contingent thing that they liked for the revolution. Are there any natural right principles uh, like, I think the kind of distance from authority that might be helpful you know, in a time where- When you say distance, you don't mean physical. You don't mean physical distance. You mean that these, this, this regime, these authorities of this regime are so far removed from us, they don't represent us anymore? I think he alludes to physical distance, but I do think it's, it's more than that. There is, there is a, a distance from life, that, that the lived situation, I, I'm thinking of a sermon I think he gave um, in like May of 76, uh, on Providence, where he, he does seem to suggest that um, the lived situate conditions of the colonies constitute uh, uh, an existence that is not properly understood mm -hmm. by parliament anymore. And so there's a kind of, the, the authority to legislate for the good of, of the colonies, they, they probably can't understand the, what that good looks like. Right. Uh, anymore. And so it's not just physical distance, but that, so, that seems to be something. Well, I don't know if he uses phrases like common good or political common good when he's yeah. talking about those sorts of things. But you know, the classic natural law argument about political authority is that it's it's directed to the political common good of a particular political community. Now, notice I said political common good. I'm not talking about the all all in comprehensive common good of every, all individuals and all communities at all times that Aquinas talks about when he gives one particular definition of the common good. I'm talking about the political common good, which is the specific conditions pertinent to the, the political community for which the political authority has responsibility. To have that responsibility, to exercise it properly, you presumably need to be in touch with and know about the conditions within that, for that particular community. So uh, I, I haven't read that, that, that section from Witherspoon, but if he's saying that they're so far distant physically, they can't possibly know who we are. So therefore we have to establish our own authorities who can make our own decisions for us, for our own political common good, then that's a type of natural law argument in some respects. But if he also means that they have become so distant that they are no longer interested in the conditions that help us to flourish because they have other agendas like the empire or the need to reinforce the authority of the king in parliament, then that's, you know, you could say, well, in that respect, um, a natural law argument would say that there's a case to establish a new political community with new authorities who will have responsibility for the particular political good, common good of that particular community. So yes, you could, well, you could certainly argue something like I'm not saying it's necessarily applicable to the United States today, um, but I think it's a, it's a, a valid argument that can easily de be developed. Yes. Any hope for any handles that we can grab onto to try to reestablish natural law thinking in America today? when the mainstream of American political thought, certainly academic political thought, is now so deeply hostile to it. Well, well, I mean, we, uh, well, let me, let me just talk about law for a moment. Lawyers and legal systems operate much more upon natural law principles than they actually realize. Um, basic principles of natural justice clearly are derived from some dimension of natural law. Uh, forms of procedural justice, I think, reflect very clearly that there are certain ways that it is right and good to treat people and certain ways that it is wrong and bad to treat people. In fact, I think you really can't understand the workings of the legal system on a very basic day-to-day -day basis without, if you really don't believe in natural law, the, the legal system would cease to work, I think. Even in systems that are presented or understand themselves as deeply positivistic. So I guess what I'm saying is that 
to the extent that we can alert people to these things that, you know, you're actually much more reliable upon this archaic thing that you dismiss as being the work of theocrats and people who lived in the Middle Ages, et cetera, et cetera. You're actually much more dependent upon this than you really understand. Um, I have noticed when I've given talks to groups like the Federalist Society, and I allude to some of this, because there's plenty of positivists there. You, know, you can see the light come on a little bit. So, oh yeah, I guess that's the reason why we do that. I guess that's the reason why contracts work that way. It's not just, there is an element, it's something like contracts, for example. Whether people realize it or not, contracts reflect both community of justice and the workings of distributive justice. You can't understand contract law, especially when it comes to things like bankruptcy, without those basic principles at work. And where do those principles come from? They come from the natural law tradition. So I think the more that we can alert people to the ways in which we depend on natural law principles and reasoning much more than we realize, I think that's a way of at least opening some people's minds to the possibility that law is more than just a social fact. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's other things, obviously, challenging, challenging whenever one can in the right way with the appropriate audience. Um, some of the alternative legal philosophies and political philosophies that are at work. Um, and you don't even need to use the phraseology of natural law. You don't even need to use that. Just, oh, we're just talking about reason or public reason. Let's use Rawlsian terms like public reason. There are ways to do this, um, which I think you may not persuade the people who you're arguing against, but the people watching the argument are the ones who are in fact much more important. So if you and I were here and John Rawls was raised from the dead, <laughs> sitting over there um, and we were debating him, He's not going to change his mind, but people here will very quickly, I think, start to see some of the real differences. So, um, uh, but I, another thing I think which is important, this is much more long-term thing, I think that explicating the natural law roots of things ranging from constitutionalism to property law to contracts uh, to the very way in which um, uh, Const liberal constitutional regimes work. I think there's so much natural law that's built into those things and historians who bring this type of stuff out into the open air to be seen by people, I think that's a, that's a long-term way, I think, of alerting people to these things. So the person, I, when I was talking a lot about Blackstone, I read the, the biography of Blackstone that was written by this Australian academic that I mentioned. And <clears throat> The reason I read it, and because I wanted to sort of learn more about the time and the context, but he brings out all the natural law dimension of Blackstone in a way which I don't think had been done for a very, very, very long time. And that's, a, and he's, I don't even think he believes in natural law himself, the author, the biographer. But the point is he shows that this is all part of what's going on in Blackstone's life, Blackstone's writings and Blackstone's commentaries. And that's, I think, you know, for someone who's a, sort of hardline positivists to see that and understand that, even if they don't agree with it. That's an exercise in historical retrieval, which I think we could do a lot more of. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, the next major event the APPI is going to be sponsoring, um, I hope the buzz is beginning to get around about this, is an April 15th and 16th conference on America, liberalism, and Catholicism. Uh, APPI is co-sponsoring this with uh, UD's Provost Office and also with the uh, Ryan Anderson's uh, chair. And it's going to be a, a two-day conference that we will bring in uh, uh, Pat Deneen, uh, uh, Chad Pecknold from Catholic University, Francesca Murphy from Notre Dame, as well as some uh, uh, local talent, uh, Rob Coons from the University of Texas. And it should be, I think, a, a really outstanding. Uh, some, some guy who writes at the Times, too. Uh, Ross Douthat. <laughs> you, you may know that the APPI has sponsored the Share Lecture every year for the last six years or so. And Ross Douthat. Uh, is going to be giving the share lecture as part of this conference.
uh, on April 15th. So look forward to that. It should be a really interesting one. The following week on I think it's a, it's a two C or one C, it's April 21st, uh, Catherine Kirsten from the Center for the American Experiment in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul is going to be speaking on uh, schools and the challenge of transgenderism. Uh, because, of course, this is becoming a big issue in, in various schools, uh, including actually one of the first places this actually happened was out in Fort Worth, uh, where you have instances of schools supporting transgender identities, explicitly denying parents uh, any knowledge of what is going on in the school. So, at any rate, uh, Kirsten has written on this subject, and uh, she'll be speaking on April 21st. So I think that's what we have. One credit seminar. Yeah. Uh, another thing APPI does is offer a one credit seminar on natural law as part of a, a group of courses, kind of head toward a kind of certificate in natural law studies that we offer through the UD's one credit courses. Uh, lots of interesting courses. Dr. Sanford has taught a course on natural law and virtue. Uh, Dr. Doherty has taught one on natural law and the common good. Uh, this semester, I'm doing, I'm doing one on natural law liberalism, basically a book I wrote uh, in 2006. Uh, in the fall, the, we're going to have a, a new course in that series, and it's going to be Ratzinger on natural law. And Professor Daniel Burns is going to be offering that. So that should be a, a, a great course. I mean, I mean Ratzinger is just a really, really smart guy, very interesting guy. <laughs> and he said a lot of really interesting things about natural law, especially in the series of uh, talks that he's given to you know, secular European leaders. So uh, uh, that uh, still, it's not actually, well, it, it, will, it should be on the books soon. So you'll have a chance to, uh, to sign up for that uh, in what, a couple of weeks, I guess. We're probably going to start the start pre-registration for the fall. So, uh, so thanks very much for coming. And uh, we hope to see you at more uh, APPI events in the future. So thank you.